Welcome everybody to our DBS panel discussion with uh, individuals who have experienced the DBS therapy for more than six years. I'm Polly Dawkins, Executive Director of the Davis Finney Foundation, and I'd like to thank our panelists and our sponsors. Uh, thank you to Medtronic and to Boston Scientific for supporting our work and helping us get critical information out uh, to our community to help our community make the best informed decisions about health and uh, needs. I'd like to start by going around the room and asking you all on the panel to introduce yourselves and tell us who you are and how long you've had Parkinson's and how long you've had the DBS therapy and also which uh, device manufacturer you have implanted. So I'm gonna go around the screen as I see you. And that's gonna start with Michael. Hi there, my name is Mike Fanning. I was diagnosed in 2001, so I've had Parkinson's for 21 years. I, was, uh, I had a DBS surgery in 2015 and it's Medtronic system. Great, next up, Davis. My name is Davis Benny, and I've had PD for going on 22 plus years and had the surgery 14 years ago. And I have a Medtronic Activa, which was the only game in town when I had my surgery. That makes sense. Randy, welcome. Hi, I'm, I'm Randy LeBlanc. I'm in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and I was diagnosed uh, in 2005, um, 17 and a half years ago, at the age of 45. Uh, I had DBS surgery in 2018, six, six, six years ago. Yeah. And I have the Medtronic Activa PC also. And that was also the only game in town here in Baton Rouge, at least at that time. So. Makes sense. Jill, welcome. Hi, my name is Jill Ader. Um, I was diagnosed also in 2005. So I'm like Randy, I'm at 17 plus years. Um, I had my DBS done 10 years ago, start in March, it'll be 10 years. And I started with, I have a weird system. I started with the Medtronic system and I switched two years ago to a Boston Scientific stimulator. So I've got what they call a hybrid system. And I switched again just three weeks ago from the Boston um, recharge, the Boston replaceable to the Boston rechargeable. Terrific. Kevin, welcome. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Kevin Kwok, now living here in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, I've had my, my DBS system implanted since 2013, and I was one of the ones that actually requested DBS earlier on in the course of my disease. I've had Parkinson's now for about 13 years. And uh, the system that they implanted in me was a di slightly different one off of Medtronic. It was the Activa PC Plus S, which was a research device to study adaptive closed loop DBS, which I've been in trials for five years. Thank you. Welcome, Marty. Hi. Hi, I'm Marty Acevedo from San Diego. Um, I've been living with Parkinson's for 18 years and had DBS seven years ago, had the Percept Medtronic system implanted, but with my battery change in August, I ha now have, I'm sorry, I had the Activa implanted in 2016. And with my battery change in August of this year, I switched to the Percept stimulator. Thank you all for sharing that. So to start off, uh, would somebody tell us, or maybe all of you could tell us, uh, what was your first line of treatment uh, with Parkinson's? And, and then we'll ask about how you decided to investigate DBS or deep brain stimulation. Well, I started 
doing medication like I think everybody else did. Mm -hmm. And you get to a point with the medication at least where it's either not effective or it's sometimes effective or it causes too many side effects. So that's when I started looking into DBS. I also started with carbidopa levodopa and after only three years on it on a very small dose I had, pretty marked dyskinesia. So my movement disorder specialist said that the only therapy that he could recommend at that time was DBS. Okay. Similar mm -hmm. experience, I, it was, I, I used uh, medication for quite some time, but I, my dyskinesias were so bad that, that there was the next, next uh, plan of attack for to, to address the symptoms, so. I actually started on um, dopamine agonist Requip, uh, Requip XL, mm -hmm. and I was on that for probably three, three or four years. Well, I was on nothing in the beginning, and that was pretty miserable time. And then I spent about three years on the Requip, and then uh, moved to uh, Stilevo, which is Carbidopa, Levodopa, and Tacopa, and then the the DVS. Uh, well, my my, I I went well, I think fourteen years before I chose to get DBS, and the uh, the dyskinesias got so bad. I was I was still working full time, <clears throat> managing some large projects, and to keep up, I had to take a significant amount of uh, the levodopa, the dopaminergic drugs, and my my movement was just horrible. I moved all the time. So yeah, that's why I decided to go on DBS. Yeah. Kevin, you mentioned you investigated DBS early. Ahead of that, what was your treatment choice? Yeah, you know, they say, I'm a pharmacist by background, and it's ironic because I don't like medication. I try to minimize it where I can. My personal experience was that while I started on a low dose cinnamon, I quickly started escalating it. And then I, they started adding in dopamine agonists. And I felt that I was in this uncontrolled state where I was becoming a slave to medication. Mm -hmm. yeah. So my, my desire to go to DBS was really to get more control over my life. And so I went to um, my neurologist at the time, Helen Bronte Stewart at Stanford, and I went with a paper that had just been published on the European earlier use in patients. And she said to me that, you know, she'd always considered me a patient for DBS, but it was a little bit early at the time, but she said that she would try to advocate for me. And that's what started the whole ball going early on. Kevin, Kevin, remind me what year that was. 2013. That was the same year I did it in Denver. And how many years were you into your Parkinson's? Eight. I think when I was considering it, Parkinson's or DBS was still considered, save it for the last effort, last ditch instead yeah. of doing it earlier. And yeah. so I'm really glad that I elected it sooner than later. It changed my life completely. Yes. Yes. Great. Barty always says it saved her life and I yeah. did it. Gave yeah. us our life back. Ab absolutely. Yeah. I, I tell everyone it was sort of like daylight savings time on steroids. <laughs> <laughs> It gave me back years of life. Exactly. Davis, what was your treatment plan before you considered DBS? Well, back when I was diagnosed, the conventional wisdom was that cinemat was to be avoided until later in your course. And so I went straight on dopamine agonists which were fairly much of a disaster for me. I felt terrible. And I always was taking these three-hour naps in the middle of the morning. 
and and so the agonist didn't work at all for me and and so then I just fairly much eschewed um most Parkinson's meds for four or five years and finally though I was convinced that cinnamon would be a good drug choice for me and so I started on it and I had probably one and a half or two really good years where the drug works perfectly but then of course you start getting more dyskinetic and 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 whatnot and I was I was very quickly escalating from two to three pills to 10 to 12. And so my dyskinesia and or tremor were just so horrible and so pronounced. Mm -hmm. And so I was really happy to have, have the choice to be able to take the DBS. So some of you started exploring this idea of what life was like before you chose DBS. I know both Marty and Jill, it seemed to resonate with you, that comment. What, what was going on for you before you uh, chose DBS, physically or emotionally? or? I think what Kevin said, you're a slave to your medication is exactly right. I mean, I was taking up to 18, I was taking 24 pills a day, 18 of them being cinnamon. Wow. Sometimes it worked, sometimes wow. it didn't. And it really, you know, and then when it worked, I would have the dyskinesia. So it was always a juggling act. And actually when they first told me about DBS, I said, no way in <laughs> hell am I gonna do this. So yeah, I'm Kevin was going for it. I would say, no, I'm not. It's the last thing I was going to do. And I really did try almost everything else first. I mean, to the point I was doing hypnotherapy and I was doing magnet therapy and I was doing working out three hours a day. And all that in acupuncture and chiropractic and physical therapy, and as well as multivitamins, diet changes. I really tried everything. And they all helped, but nothing was long term. Mm. And I remember having to find there was when I decided on DBS after I finally got to a point of saying, you know, it's either that or jump off a bridge. Mm. I mean, that's how. Yeah. And that's what we hear a lot is that people get to a point of desperation where their medicines are no longer effective, or if they are effective, they have to suffer so much dyskinesia and so much tremor or, or whatever before they get to that nice calm state and and yeah I think it, if, if you're talking about elective brain surgery it, it, <laughs> you know it's a big decision yeah and so I can empathize with Jill because you know it, it's just not something that you think of as as on your bucket list of things to do in your life. Huh. But but if you do choose that and you have a successful procedure, it was definitely life changing. I think my surgeon said to me, oh, I was concerned about neurosurgery and he said to me, Well oh, Marty, it's just a it's just a procedure. It's not really that big of a deal. It's not neurosurgery like you know, taking a tumor out or operating on a bleed. And I said, doctor, you're putting leads into my brain. That's neurosurgery. It's a pretty big deal. <laughs> um, but yeah. I had such a positive outcome. I'd do it again in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. That's great. Kevin. You know, you know, uh, one of the things that mm -hmm. to balance it out, right? You know, we all live in this world where there's a lot of research going on in the bio, in the pharmaceutical industry. And I sort of came into this with this idea that even though people are saying a cure is in sight any day now, um, the reality of real drug research is it's decades, not months and years. And so here was an existing technology that worked, worked well in many people 
and people were discounting it or sort of setting it aside. And I took the opposite approach. I said, why not go with that? And in addition, wait for these new medications to be developed. So it was really more of a take control now attitude that I took. Well, and can I ask the panel, did you have someone who had paved the way for you who had had the procedure that you knew of or not? I could only find two people in the whole country. One was Yuma Bev from the Parkinson's Humor blog. Right. And the other one was a guy I found in Minnesota who had done it. And there had been a local article written about him and they were both lovely to talk to. And Yuma Bev, who does this Parkinson's Humor blog had photos of the whole thing. And she spent time with me going over every process, every part of the process, which made me feel a lot better about it. I also had right. someone locally that I talked to. He was active in the Parkinson's community here in San Diego. And we had breakfast and a number of meetings after that. And he explained, did, as Jill said, explained every piece of the puzzle and the things that might not be helped, like um, dystonia and some other things. And then since then, I've been the one that people um, go to for, uh, for to learn about DBS. Right. Bring it forward. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. you know, I didn't have anyone either, and I it timed well because it was during, just before the decision that I had to make it, I attended the World Parkinson's Congress in uh, Montreal, and, and I was like a groupie. I just hung on to all the uh, Michael Oaken and um, patients and went to all the smaller independent workshops. I think I spent three straight days just trying to talk to patients there. It was a great avenue for learning. Yeah. When <clears throat> my, my doctor brought the subject up to me, oh, about 20, 2012, 2013, somewhere around then. And the only person I knew at that time <clears throat> was actually one of the founders of our local support group. He was, uh, he was uh, diagnosed with Parkinson's at 29. He was a uh, uh, a minister, and he he couldn't practice. Obviously, shortly after, he was like the tenth person that Joe Jankovic at Baylor in Houston implanted with DBS. So very early on, but he was struggling when I met him. So, you know, at that time for me, the, I, I'm all about the data and the research and the technical article, articles from NIH. And there just wasn't that much out there at that time. And I told the doctor, I said, there is no way in hell you were putting <laughs> that in my brain. Not gonna happen. So I, I waited, that was 13. I had it done in 18, is that, uh, yeah, 18. And, but Randy, afterwards, didn't you wish you had done it before? After oh, absolutely, I did. Yeah, and, that, you know, like, like Kevin said, that was the last resort at that time, you know. And but by the time I did it, Michelle Lane, I know very well from New Orleans, she had her DBS. Um, I, there were two other there were two other people in our support group that had it, but. The problem was after I had mine, I had a couple of issues and I asked these folks that already had it. I said, where, where were my friends, you know, tell them, warning me ahead of time. This is, you know, this is what to expect. So I came back and I, I actually sat the four of us down and I made, I did a write up and I said, I want to know everything that went right and everything that went wrong for you. And we came up with a, I, I did a write up for, from the group and uh, my oldest daughter who is a semi-professional um, copy editor and writer for magazine, got it and she looked at it and she said, dad, this is like an engineer wrote it. I said, well, he did. So she rewrote it in regular English for us. And I give that to everybody. Here's what you can expect, you know. So, but 
Yeah, it, it was very concerning to me in the beginning that there was not that much information. Yeah, yeah can I add to Randy's comment? Sure. You know, um, we all hear about the successes, right? I mean, I, after my DBS, I, I completely went off medication for four mm -hmm. years, and I became such a proponent. I mean, I would blindly go out and just sing the song of DBS to everyone. But and, and I became an advisor to patients almost every month. A different patient would reach out to me saying, should I do it or not? And I would always emphatically say, give it a shot. You go for it, right? Mm -hmm. And the one thing, Randy, that I'll, I'll tag on to what you just said is that in more recent times, I've had a few patient friends who've not had such a positive experience. Mm -hmm. And I feel the weight and the guilt of pushing them or recommending them into it without really giving them the full balanced story. One of the things that I would love to see manufacturers do out here is not just sing the praise of those of us success stories, but also provide support when things go not as well as expected because they are there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are, there are too many of them out there as well. That's right. Although I do think the percentage is low. If it's you, it doesn't matter what the percentage is. You know, I, I always compare it to you're failing a class. If you're in school and you're failing a class, DBS won't necessarily give you an A, but would a C be better than failing? Maybe you'll get a B, maybe you will get the A. I definitely got an A out of it. I got an A too, but I've seen people get Bs. I, I agree with you, Kevin, the guilt of being having had a successful outcome um, kind of hit sometimes if I'm very measured and encouraging someone I say everyone's different and we all are going to have different outcomes. But mm -hmm. it's more than just the device manufacturers, it's the surgeon, it's the experience of the surgeon getting to the right spot in the brain, the sweet spot in the brain that they need to get to. And then the programming after that, if that's done appropriately by the movement disorder specialist or whoever's doing the programming. So there's a whole team of things that have to go right for, for DBS to be successful. Right, it's true. I've been, I've been very careful about what I tell people about my DBS. And because I, I've had friends of mine who've had expectations that were not met when they had their DBS surgery. So my my comment to people is don't expect to come out with anything. Come out, hopefully, hopefully you can come out with it with coming out no no worse off than when you went into surgery. And then everything every positive head that happens is a blessing. And so so you don't have the expectations of what what's going to happen. Everything is a blessing. So that's. Yeah, I think that's what we hear about setting realistic goals. Yeah. Yeah. So when you think about what your goals were for your DBS surgery. Do you all remember, it's been many, many years since you had the, the first, uh, since you had the implant. Um, do you remember what your goals were for, for that or where you were, how you were feeling and what you hoped to feel afterwards, what you hoped to change? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't call them goals. I would say I had hope that I would get some relief from my tremor. And, and then when I was in the OR and I was thrashing around all over because you can't take your meds beforehand and you're pretty miserable and your head's locked in place and every other part of your body were going nuts. But when my neurologist, which was also Kevin's neurologist, Helen, said, well, let's just see about the placement of this lead and let's put some juice through the line. And it was just like this instantaneous, ah. And all that thrashing, all that tension went away. It was one of the most profound experiences of my life. And and so then, then I had the taste of what it would be like when they eventually, eventually programmed me 
and the programming was straightforward enough that I was able to walk out of there with my hands at my side instead of in my back pocket or or my tremor tactics were all able to be put aside. Mm -hmm. And that's what was so, that was the miracle of that day. Yeah. You know, I had less of a tremor, more just pain and stiffness. And I just wanted to stop hurting and to sleep. I was only sleeping about two hours a night. Yeah. Since I had DBS 10 years ago, I can sleep nine, eight, nine, 10 hours without even waking up. Wow. Every so night. Do I, do I remember you were also maybe in a wheelchair? Is that true, Jill? For a while I was right before at the end because I was in so much pain. Hmm. Yeah, that sleep thing, they, they kind of warn you going into it that they, they don't expect to see it. But it was a very pleasant addition in my life too, Jill. It's sort of, there's there's a bunch of things that they don't want to overclaim. But I think we all react differently to DBS. We all see different benefits or complications which are not the same amongst all of us. Well, and the other thing I think you have to remember is it's not a cure. It's I mean, not. we've all seen over the years, our Parkinson's has gotten worse. So I did the same, I cut down because I had mine in the subthalamic nucleus, the STN, which they're doing less and less of now. But um, when I did that, I was able to cut my meds down from those 18 pills I was taking of Cinemet to zero. Yeah, I'm like you. But now, thinking. but over the years, I've gotten more and more and more. I've added back in. I don't take cinnamon. I take Ritari, but I've had, now I take four a day. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do any of you ever turn your DBS systems off? I yeah. had to do it recently when I had, before. I just got my new rechargeable battery. And before that, I my surgery, I had to have an EKG, which was all about two and a half minutes. They so had to turn it off. And immediately, you know why you have it. Right. Like, okay, got it. Reminder. Yeah. I mean, I I, feel, I used to use it for stupid human tricks to show people, <laughs> right? And um, I don't do it anymore, but it's so profound when you turn it off that yeah. you realize how much benefit you're getting that you, you've just taken for granted otherwise. I, I do it on occasion. My my wife gets very mad at me when I do it. Yeah, my but I do it for the. Uh, I work with the local um, PT college and the, their nursing school, and I will turn it off to show them how how it well it works. Also, I I uh, attended one of the graduate uh, courses at LSU. Or kinesiology and when the the professor there is a very good friend of mine and when they teach the the parkinson's unit she asked me to come in and i turn it off for them and show them the difference and it's amazing now I, I did not have resting resting tremor i have the bradykinesia and it's just a real slow movement and so when I turn it off, I you, know, you end up stooped over and shuffling. But uh, it, it's it's not as dramatic as the the resting tremor because they they our local neuromedical center has several of my friends are on there, and one of them, I mean, he's he's doing like this, and the doctor turns it on and he stops. You know, for me, I was about half an hour in the programming room with him and he said walk down the hall I said okay you good you can go home I said but what's different but my my wow moment came the next morning when I woke up and went to make coffee and could didn't have to wait for my meds so yeah and I also went from about well 1600 milligrams of of um um, do, um, leave a dopa per day to zero for over a year, and now I'm, I'm coming back to. I mean, I take 
more and more as time goes on, but yeah. Well, because that, okay. that it goes back to the fact that it's not a cure. Right, right. Well, and don't you feel that people who don't understand what it's like to live on an on-off cycle don't get why? Well, why wouldn't you just keep taking some medicine? Right. And, and, and that whole goal that we all had, which was to get off medicine, sure. that I would say was a goal as well. And I was able to achieve that for five years. Mm -hmm. And now I also only, I take very minimal amount of Vitari, mm -hmm. one, one pill twice a day. But, but, but not having the dyskinetic effect and not mm -hmm. having, and, the, and of course not having any tremor at all is really what allows me to sleep. Mm -hmm. And so I would say, that, that well, it's, it's not a cure, and it never will be. It it feels almost curative to get that decent night's sleep, and and not wake up every twenty minutes and start tremoring, or be in pain or whatever. Mm -hmm. Marty, the improvement in my quality of life was so profound that. You know, I can't, that's why I say I got my life back. Um, I was able to start exercising again, which allowed me to do a lot of other things, improve my balance. I wasn't falling anymore. I take two meds right now and um, and I had DBS seven years ago, but I only take two, one's for dystonia and one's for Parkinson's. And um, it's it was just so immensely positive for me to have DBS, but then my type of Parkinson's is different from everybody, from most other people. So not everyone's going to have a really robust response. Oh. Kevin. Yeah, I went back and looked at my medical chart uh, from Stanford, and what it said was the target goal was a 30% improvement. But I'm not really sure what they meant by 30% was. Is it over what? UPDRS. Yes, uh, you, yeah, exactly. Reduction in meds, quality of life. I think it was a combination of all of them. But like Marty, what happened was because of that great feeling that I initially got from DBS, I started exercising feverishly like crazy. Mm -hmm. I also switched jobs to a less stressful job. Mm -hmm. um, and I was sleeping better. So I tell everyone, DBS allowed me to do all those different things. And the my, total of it all is what made my life so much better. Right. Yeah, my husband always says it gave us both a second chance at life. Right. Which is why we're now moving to Portugal. Awesome. Uh, can we come visit? Absolutely, yeah. Kevin. Too bad yeah. place ready for you. I've already signed up. So <laughs> no, but that's the thing is when I travel, nobody knows I have Parkinson's. Yeah. I mean, that's the biggest difference because they don't they can't see it. My voice is slowed down. My I do use walking sticks when I'm traveling. But, you know, I can go out at night and sit somewhere and nobody can tell there's anything wrong, which gives you a lot of personal satisfaction. It's like getting a good haircut. You know, you just feel better around people. Not, not all of us can make it look as good as you do, Jill. <laughs> yeah. so. Mike, Mike, how has your life changed since DBS? I didn't get a chance to try it. My disease are so bad that I thought it was going to child for dance with networks and dance with network stars <laughs> i didn't get a chance to do that so because dbs was working work for me so. <laughs> but you know humor has got to be a big part of my my life i just if you're not laughing you're crying i would rather laugh and exercise a little bit than cry and be sorry for myself but uh but uh yeah so but i was taking almost 27 or 28 cinema a day before DBS and when DBS, after I had DBS, it dropped down to six or five for in the next few years. But I'm back up with, you know, with the volume has gone up again because it just, because it's progressive disease, but I always like this good. So I'm just, it's a blessing that I had the surgery.
Well, and can I ask any everyone to weigh in on how much their programming has had an effect and how much of their medicine need came back into the picture? Well, I always explain it that it's a balance. So if you're between the programming and the meds, and you, everybody, as Marty said, everybody's different. You've got to work with a really good programmer. So that's really what, probably the most important of all of them, I think. Actually, I call it the five, six Ps, and which is the product that, because there's many, there's just, there's not just Medtronics and Boston Scientific. There's another company who I can't think of right now. Abbott. 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 There's the physician is the second P. Who's the surgeon who's doing it? Do they know what they're doing? And I would always ask to talk to one of their patients. The placement, do they, where is it going in your brain? Is it going in the STN or the GPI? Why? And why would your doctor do that? Is it just their standard or is it better for your symptoms? And then the programming. The, probably the most important is who's doing the programming? You should know that in advance. Yes. And do you have somebody who knows what they're doing? Is the, is the rep for mine, my doctor's great, but she also has my rep come in every, the Boston Scientific rep is there for every programming session, which is great because she knows the latest and the best for me. The patient, which is you, will you take advantage of this? And are you honest in the programming? Because the programming depends on you saying, well, it doesn't quite feel right. I feel a little pull on my lip or my throat hurts, or my left thigh, because you have to be really tuned into your body. And then the last P, I think, is the, is the family support. Which that's actually P-H-A-M. That's P-H-A. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's people. 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 And I that's the support, because it's not an easy surgery, and it's, I mean, you're still out for a while, and you have to deal with it. Well, I know the men don't care as much, but for me, it was a big issue to have my head shaved, even though they didn't do the whole thing. But a lot of people, that'll stop you because it's a, you feel more major than it is. My programming was has always been done by my movement disorder specialists, and they didn't turn my left side on for the first five years because I was so left-sided predominant with Parkinson's. We turned it on last October because of some dystonic changes. And the, my previous movement and sort of specialist did some programming that made me a lot worse. And when I reported back to her, she said, that's not what I, that didn't have anything to do with my with what I did with your DBS. So I switched doctors. He made some slight changes and everything just was great again. And just this last week, I had have been having a little bit more dystonia in my left hand and he made a slight adjustment and it cleared up just like that. So it's what Jill's saying about the five Ps is so important. You have to know your own body. You have to have a great programmer position and you have to have someone who's gonna to listen to you and work with you and put the patient first. Yeah, Kevin. Well, I, of course, you know, one, one of the, the P's, I like your P rules, the five P rules, is in the placement and the actual surgery. Uh, one of the pieces of advice that I'm giving to people is, I, I used to have great respect for the teaching hierarchy in teaching institutions where you had, you know, the main surgeon and then you had fellows and residents and others being part of the, the team and they're actually in the suite when you're having your surgery. Um, but I think seeing what I've seen with complications in other people, I'm less apt to want someone to be learning on the job, <laughs> picking <laughs> probes in my head. head. Uh, and, and that oftentimes happens. It's like, do you mind if, if we have the fellow or the resident? you know, work on you. Um, if it were me now, I would be a little less trusting of that situation. Um, it's a little different with the programming side because there's a lot of hit and miss there. But the precision of getting the lead in the right place 
is not something to be played around with. Yeah, right. Yep. Agree. Randy. Yeah, so I'm um, following up on a couple of the points that were made here. Um, I agree with Kevin. I don't want any on-the-job training on my brain. They, they can look, watch, but don't touch. But our, our, we have a, a neurosurgeon here who is second to none, according to the Medtronic guy, but I guess he would say that. But no, their success rate has been extremely good. And it's location, 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 where they put those probes is very important. But to answer Davis, you answer your question on programming. That was key for me. And in in the beginning, well, what my doc, my my movement disorder specialist did when he programmed me, the 30 minutes he spent with me and then sent me home, he said, here, I gave you a full range of adjustment capability on your amplitude or voltage and uh, I'll take that and come back in six months and tell me what you did knowing full well that I would research the heck out of it and do part part well let, yeah let me watch what I say but it's on uh, so I did and, and it worked out fine for about a year and then I started having falls my my speech really deteriorated terribly. It's it's a little rough today because I didn't sleep too well last night, but generally it's not terrible. But, um, you know, then I started researching that and I found out that you could program differently. <clears throat> well, about, a, I guess this is maybe last year, about a year and a half ago um, with my involvement with the Davis Finney Group, I pulled together my own panel of experts. Marty was one, Kevin was one, Jill was another one. And I, we talked through the issues I had and I got some advice from these good folks here. And I went out of my comfort zone and I went to a second opinion, the doctor at Baylor in Houston. And she put one of her, her um, residents working with me and he basically stripped me down to nothing. And he started stair stepping all the all the parameters up. And when he got there, you know, I wanted to eliminate the falls where well, they improved my handwriting, they improved my speech, they improved my falls. I mean, those have virtually gone away. So programming is very important. But I I think one of the biggest responsibilities of the patient is first of all to understand the basics of this of the components of the signal and i don't expect everybody to be engineers i am an engineer and i understand it but i bring it to my doctor he says well you give me too much credit <laughs> well, i don't I, ex I have high expectations but um yeah and then like like jill said you have to um be honest about what, what you're feeling and you have to be your own advocate there. You have to be relentless and tell them, no, this is not working. No, this is not as good as it gets. And if that's the answer you get, go somewhere else. So. Davis. I mean, that's two really great points. One being that you need to be able to be brave enough to change doctors or change mm -hmm. programs if that's needed. And it's not even necessarily a knock on your original program, mm -hmm. but they, they, they only know what they know in terms of their experience and, and their success with programming you. And so sometimes changing doctors just gives you a, a fresh or different set of eyes mm -hmm. looking at the problem. And so I agree with Randy that that's really very important. Davis, you and I have talked about this because we've had similar programmers and surgeons. But sometimes, and I don't know if the rest of the panel experienced this, is that when we go in for our programming, sometimes the positive in, 
out input that we give to our programmer doesn't really relay how we're feeling 10 minutes after we leave the office. Right. That's because we like being rock stars when we walk in <laughs> and we like seeing them, them seeing us in our best state. That, and that's think, exactly right. right. Well, that's why I use a lot of logs. I keep an ongoing log list so that I have something, that, you know, we have in the Davis Finney um, book in our Every Victory Counts um, worksheets, the what to talk to your doctor about. When you go yeah. for your appointment, I don't remember what what's that one called, Polly? Do you remember? Uh, how to prepare for your doctor's appointment? Right, yeah, maybe that one. So I keep an ongoing list on my phone, and then I make sure that I come in with that, and so I don't forget. So that when I'm frustrated, when I'm not in the doctor's office, I have something to refer to. Yeah, I'd like to talk about this topic that some of you had touched on about complications. I'd also like to talk about you or ask you all uh, about your sort of maintenance. How do you, what do you need to do? So let's let's start with sort of the, the annual maintenance of your deep brain stimulation. What do you have to do? How often do you have to get a battery replaced or adjustments made? So starting with Michael, tell us what your experience is. My, my, my first uh, surgeries were done with uh with regular batteries, I went to rechargeable ones after having my batteries replaced three times on each side. So my, my batteries lasted less than three years each because the intensity was turned up so high, they were lasting somewhere between 18 months and two years. Mm -hmm. So the last batteries I had went to went to rechargeable batteries. So um, how's that so going? It's it's going well, but you know, it's a little bit of work. I mean, it's, you have to recharge your batteries about every you know, seven days or so, and, and the, the time it takes is you can either recharge them like a little bit every day, or to take them and do it once a, once a week, and it takes like four or five hours a day to do it once a week. So, yeah, but it takes a little bit of time. So, can yeah. I follow up on that, Michael? Because I just switched to a to a rechargeable. Sure. And it takes mine took an hour last night for the first for the third time once a week for an hour my and one of my concerns was having to do it all the time because i know that the system my mother has the same she has a rechargeable and has to recharge every day and that i didn't want that because of my travel and they said mine can go up to four weeks if without it wow well that's great is it any different than recharging your phone no, you know what? If you excuse me, I'll run and get the thing so you can see it. It's right in my room. Well, you can walk away I'm from your phone. More just the burden of, of charging. Hmm. We all no. keep our phones charge all the time. Right. But you know what? I think it's a matter of figuring out how much power you individually need. So you don't get that what they call range anxiety. Mm -hmm. Wonder if it's like driving an electric car. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Out. exactly. But then I also now don't have to worry about travel and getting back to change my battery. Because like Michael, I was changing every two years. So my first battery change was in August, and that I had the first one for six and a half years. So I don't use a lot of my uh, bat. I don't have a lot of battery usage. So I don't have much maintenance at all on a regular basis. I just see my my movement disorder specialist every three to four months. Mm -hmm. We and we may may or may not make some programming changes during that time. Thank you, yeah. Davis. What's your experience been with changing out or maintenance for your system? Well, first of all, I had to give my unit a name, so I call him Bob, <laughs> and now I'm on Bob Four after all these years, but. I mean, I had my first battery change probably five and a half years in, and then it went down a little bit from there. But I'm still going on four plus years with this with this rendition of Bob. And so I see my neurologist and or his PA probably once every three to six months. I mean, neurologist. I'll see, yeah, at maximum one, twice, once or twice a year. But the PA is a real godsend for 
Kevin and I, who who also shared the same neurologist here in Colorado. Mm -hmm. And Randy, what's been your experience with replacement or maintenance uh, that you have to do? So I'm still on my original battery. Well, it's six years. I was concerned. In fact, uh, Jill and I had a conversation uh, yesterday afternoon about, um, you know, the the traveling with with your battery, and um, I'm I'm gonna take her advice and wait to get on the road again, but until my battery uh, gets changed. Uh, the, there's some complication with the insurance company. Mm -hmm. they, they want you to hit almost rock bottom mm -hmm. before they're gonna pay for the change now. And I don't know, I don't know how it was early on. But anyway, it's, uh, I mean, as far as maintenance goes, I see, well, I, I've had quite a few appointments late uh, over the past year because I went for my second opinion. And I was actually honing in on the, the same answer with my neurologist, with the research I had done. I would go in and tell him, let's tweak here, here, here. He'd make the changes, but you're, the limitation the patient has, it was gonna take five years to get to that solution. So I told him I don't have that kind of time. So I got, got to tell him, another neurologist to do the programming. Since then, they really have not changed it at all. But I, I, I will go up or down a little bit, depending on how I feel on a given day. Sometimes I get restless leg in the evening and I can tune that out a little bit. Or if I get um, a little dyskinesia, I can, I can tune it out, you know, sometimes, not always. So I, I'm pretty, active in, in using my my patient programmer or programming abilities to uh, try and optimize my my life with it yeah does, does anyone else do that they use their home programmer i never touch it i think yeah, most, me neither. most people in my experience don't know where they keep it or <laughs> I think I've lost yeah. more of them than I've used them. Yeah. Yeah. Michael, do you yeah. use yours? What's Michael, that? Do, you use, do you use your programmer to change your settings? No, no I've got the opportunity. I've got the opportunity to change it. I have the opportunity to use it, but I don't do it. Yeah. Sounds Even. like Randy's the only one here who does that. Yeah, Kevin. I had an interesting situation where. Uh, I came to, I've had two battery changes, my, my last one in 2020. Um, and I was really hoping that technology would advance where the newest one would be available at the time that I was switching out uh, batteries so that I could go to an adaptive DVS system. But unfortunately, it wasn't ready yet, and I didn't qualify for any of the studies that were going on to resume the research device. Right. So I had to elect to go to a battery that was the shortest lasting, mm -hmm. uh, because I you want insurance to cover it at the at the end when you do switch out, and so I went to to a device that would last hopefully just two to three years. And at the next switch, I'm hoping that technology and the approvals of adaptive DVS will catch up. You know what, on that note, Kevin, I was concerned about that, especially going to the rechargeable because it's good for 15 years, they say. Exactly. And I don't want an iPhone, iPhone 7 when they have the 15 coming out. <laughs> right. Yeah. But they said they did. My doctor and the rep from Ed, from Boston Scientific both said that Medicare, at least, will now cover if the technology would make a difference in your treatment. That they will cover a new change, even if you don't technically need it. I, I, I'm Kevin. I'm glad you brought that up because I I had the same thought process, and I'm probably not going to go with the rechargeable next year when I get mine changed. For that reason, but the the pro well, had had I known where the technology was going to go, 
course, have, if I had that crystal ball, I wouldn't know. Yeah, anyway. So the, um, but yeah, if, if we had had the, the directional probes, that would I would have jumped on that quickly. The the segmented probes that mm -hmm. Boston came out with, and that um, Medtronic has since copied. So it, um, yeah. So the but the technology is changing so fast and furious. But the problem is, you know, what's in your brain is the key right now. You know? With uh, I have a new percept. Yeah. battery from Medtronic and it has um it can store data and that type of thing that does drain your battery sooner but the next level of technology that's coming out will allow the device to be to do more I don't have the directional leads and all of that but still the new new technology and the battery itself is going to be pretty pretty cool especially with the management of dystonia which is my most significant problem at this point right but they they can also do some uh current um you know they they can split the current right the different probes and and there is some advantage but it's not nearly as big as it would be if we had the option had had the option all of us obviously none of us have the the you know, segmented probes since you all have had it for so long yeah, yeah. yeah. i'm gonna ask right. another question uh and and then uh begin to wrap up but actually two more questions for you all if you have the time then while uh, jill shows off her rechargeable uh recharging unit there well, let me just show you this is the unit that stays plugged in and you just pop this out stick it in and it just sits over your shoulder correct mm -hmm. and that's it that's how is that, I recharge. yours is like mike as well pretty similar well, it's a little bit different than that it's more of a holster than anything else and then a sling and so if, if it's not set sitting exactly where it's supposed to it's it doesn't doesn't uh it doesn't recharge as effectively so so that's why it takes a little bit longer because you have to really sit you say very still for quite a bit of time so it's a little bit different than but it looks like you could walk around and vacuum davis you could do your vacuuming if you vacuuming want. might be hard yeah it'll beep at you if you're in, if it moves off of your yeah side. super all right, next next question for you all. Uh, I know it sounds like Mike has had the most surgical battery replacements in the time, but and and maybe Davis has had the therapy for the longest. Has anybody had any major malfunctions or complications that you'd like to talk about? <laughs> Davis. Yeah. What was that, Davis? I mean. I had a nightmare a few years back where where I developed an infection around the unit itself in the tissue and and so we determined that it needed to be pulled out ASAP. Mm -hmm. And it it proceeded to lead me on a crash of epic proportions where I went from you know, full power to no power after some 18 years of having had that power. And I was taking, again, very minimal meds. So when I was in the hospital, they would only give me two Retari, mm -hmm. which I needed about 50 at the time. But, but because of doctor's orders and whatnot, we had this I mean, it was a real crisis for me for a, a few weeks where I couldn't get out of bed, I couldn't move, I couldn't walk, I couldn't do anything. And and that eventually resolved itself with enough medication to, to offset the DDS unit. However, when I got my unit back after three months, after the six weeks of IV antibiotics and whatnot, and I got my, I, it was just like a, that same sense of a miracle was, was relived. 
And so, I mean, I have an absolute appreciation for what my DBS can do for me and what what I would be, where I would be without it. Davis, can you clarify? They didn't take just a stimulator out where the infection was. They took the leads and everything, right? No, they left my leads in, but they they then told them back in my skull. And so uh, my leads were left intact. Uh, and otherwise, I would have had much more of a major surgery. So the because, infection was contained in the in the uh, yeah right the battery site exactly because I think our and, friend Bart had to have the leads taken out he did right he did right and that that's the case with most infections from what I understand is that they can travel very quickly to the brain but mine was outside of my unit. And so it was a little bit different than something that would be internal in the wire. Mm -hmm. Has anybody else had complications or malfunctions? Kevin? I've had a couple of situations where the leads um, were switched. Uh, and so they were mislabeled and they were stimulating the wrong side of the brain. It was almost more comical and humorous than it was dangerous. Was that programming switching? That, uh, I'm sorry? Was that a programming switching? Uh, I think it was a mislabeling from the original surgery. And so every time someone knew got a hand on the programming, they sent the convention back to the, what was they thought was the original. The question that I have for the panel is what's next when our DVS does is not as effective anymore? What's our recourse? What can we do? Uh, and I'm sort of entering into that phase now where all the joys and the and the, and the privilege of, of living good life is starting to erode away. And I was told by my neurologist here at CU, seven years is kind of the, the, the glory years. And then after that, the progression of disease starts taking over. Uh, and, and I just am curious at what others are thinking about. How do we make that longer? I'm at 10, so I wouldn't say mine's over by any means. I want to be like you. Yeah, so I'm already shaking her head as well. I think that, you know, the ability to exercise can maybe stave off that or make that length of time longer. We all know the benefits of exercise, so that helps. And again, I've said this over and over, but we're each different. My progression is very, very, very slow. So I probably have, you know, much longer than seven years or someone else might not have this, have that. Kevin, you're talking about seven years on DBS or seven yeah. years of Parkinson's? No, I'm 13 years in the Parkinson's, okay. about eight on DBS. Yeah, yeah. I just think that's a doctor who's putting all their patients in one basket. Yeah. Yeah. Because how many people have been told when you were first diagnosed, you only had 10 good years left? Mm -hmm. the very beginning. And we're all past that. So well past that. Yeah. A positive yeah. attitude goes a long way too. If you stay positive and just, you know, don't give in and keep, keep living your best life, then I think that has that, has to have some effect on, on how fast, quickly you progress and how your symptoms get worse or better or whatever. Well, and also, I mean, Marty, don't you feel like that if you prioritize your exercise and you prioritize your sleep and you prioritize your lifestyle, that, that it, it gives you your best life, as you would say. Mm -hmm. then you're prolonging that good effect. Yeah. The other thing is you, with Parkinson's in general, I think it teaches you to appreciate live fully every moment. Yes. 
for sure. Well, you know, we're all going to die someday, so you might as well enjoy it. And I think for many of us, we were young enough when we were diagnosed that we didn't even feel that coming on. I was I was 42. I My kids were only four and seven years old. And so since then, I've learned to really appreciate every day of life and not squander it. And then having, having the DBS gave me a round two of being able to really enjoy things. Um, I would like to say something in general about DBS. You know, I, I hear from a lot of people who fear it. And they, uh, I mean, we have several of the ambassadors we've had discussions with and where they, they just flat out won't even consider it, but they will try other technologies that to me are not nearly as effective. And because they hear us uh, complaining about programming issues or whatever, and I want to say that it really angers me that we don't, you know, show, show the positives enough of the DBS out there. And the, I mean, we do have, it's not perfect by any means, but nothing is. But, you know, to have them discount it so readily to me it is a crying shame because it's a great technology. You know, for whatever programming challenges I had, I mean, that was just another fun opportunity for me to play with my brain. You know, Randy, <laughs> when I think about people, I think about people having the Duopa system, which sounds yeah. like a pain in the rear. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a lot of work and a lot yeah. of effort. And then the injections that some people are doing, that's also a lot of work, a lot of effort. And I don't want, I get up every morning and don't have to do a damn thing. Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. I, I agree fully. So, but yeah, I think, I think that, it needs to be advertised as the positive thing that it is. And, and you know, the ultimately, if, if it doesn't work for you, turn it off. Right. Okay. So yeah, yeah. I would go so far as to say yank it out, but it can be if it has. So, yeah. Well, I, I mean, my only caveat to that, Randy, mm -hmm. is what Kevin said earlier which I really believe is true, is that we can all, even if we've all had tremendous results from DBS, we can really only speak for ourselves. Yeah. And, and not push it on people because I, like Kevin, was originally a big, a huge ambassador for DBS. Mm -hmm. And just say, you know, I could just say, I mean, my tour went from that insane level to, to this right. and people would would say well I want what you've got but not everyone has had had a good great result and and or even a good result and so it is something that you just have to add the caveat for me yeah. or in my case right just, oh, I, just I, to I be do. honest yeah, I do that with everything. I mean, to me, I'm not a doctor. I am but not a doctor, and I tell them locally: do not ever go to your doctor and tell them Randy said because they get very upset about that. <laughs> so I, I don't don't give medical advice. I give exactly what you said, Davis. The caveat is: this is my personal experience with it, but you know, it, it to me. We, it needs to be have a more of a positive spin on, uh, uh, you know. I mean, I think of I'm like Randy. I think there are hundreds and hundreds of people I know who've had successful DBS. I know maybe two, three people who haven't, and theirs has been pretty miserable. And I wouldn't want to be one of those two or three, but the hundreds and hundreds I do know who've had successful. Right. I think that speaks a lot. Yep. So how, how many, this is the end on a more light note, but how many have had your caps countersunk for cosmetic reasons? I think you're you're one of the only people in the world, <laughs> Cap, who doesn't have those nice horns 
binding yeah. on in your head. Well, yeah, Michael Oaken said it to me when I walked out of his workshop, when I asked him what physical things happened to you, and he says, we use the technique of countersinking where they're flush. You don't even see the caps on there. And I, I think really they do that. The new ones all do that, don't they? Do they? That's what I've heard. I mean, I like shaving my head now, you know, because <laughs> I like to show that this is my mom. Every time I shave my 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 head, it's my reminder. It's my um, it's my pink ribbon for for, for living well with Parkinson's, and I'm so yeah. grateful for DBS yeah. for giving me that. I, I kept my head shaved for about two years after I had my surgery. And, you know, and my I was going to get my little horns tattooed like Buck. No, I wasn't really. <laughs> my, my, my wife and my grandchildren shamed me into letting my hair grow back out. So you can't even tell that I had DBS. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I advertise. I always tell my story. So. That's not a problem, but yeah, it's um, but you know, for me, it, it was a life changer, just like Jill and Marty said, and every, really everybody else. I mean, it's, it's been a great ride for me. I would continue, I would do it again in a heartbeat. You know, I always and, say I do it every month again. That's yeah. how successful it's been. Yeah. Yeah. I reminded my neurologist the other day, I said, I tell the story. When you walked in the in the operating room, the neurosurgeon had he was getting ready to drill into my skull, and that my my movement disorder specialist came and put his arm on his hand on my leg. He said, "Man, I love the smell of burning bone in the morning." Oh, that, was, that was the mood in the in the operating room the whole time. But you know, there's the yeah. picture, yeah. But, um, you know, it's like, like I said, well, I don't know if you remember this, Davis, but um, we were, we were in New Orleans at the first walk that Michelle did for you guys. Right. And you and I were talking and uh, they started the Zumba warm up before the walk. Oh, that's right. And I said, well, you know, I went through five surgeries not to move like that, at, uh, not on purpose. I'll be darned if I'm going to do it on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That's awesome. It's, it's I remember been that. Been good. Been very good. Before we wrap positive. up here, uh, Michael, it looked like you had something you were going to say. Yeah. No. No. All right. I'm going to. I give it two thumbs up for DBS. Yeah, me too. It looks all of these two thumbs up. As we close out here, this terrific conversation, thank you all. Is there anything that you'd like to end on that I haven't asked that you'd like our community to know? You know, the one thing that I did occur to me, we, we talked about programming. And as Randy said, he was told to come back in six months. Those six months, I think, are key. And a good programmer is going to see you several times during those six months, I think, to get that right. It's a get, you don't walk out and feel great. Not everybody does. Sometimes it takes that whole time to get it right. But give yourself time. Be an advocate. Great Be patient. Point. And one thing that we didn't touch on, Polly, which gets us more into the DBS weed, but it's still, I think, important with bilateral versus unilateral and who's had what surgery. What do you I have bilateral? Bilateral. bilateral. My, my feeling was Davis is that it's like when you're constructing a house and you've torn down all the walls, you might as not do it twice. You might as well wire for speakers right. once. Yeah. I mean, I had, two separate, I had totally two separate surgeries. I did one side and then 17 months later did the other side. So I had two unique systems. There, right. are, there are some investigators out there that feel that 
DBS uh, can actually be disease modifying. I know they're doing those studies at Vanderbilt with uh, with Dr. Charles. Uh, and so for me, I wanted to see if my less impaired side would be would progress slower. Uh, I think it's a little early to make the claim that it is disease modifying, but I had that curiosity. Well, everybody, thank you so much. Thank you to Michael and Randy Davis, Jill. Marty and Kevin for sharing your experiences. Thank you to our sponsors, Medtronic and Boston Scientific for supporting our work and making this conversation about deep brain stimulation available to everyone. And- uh, Thank you, Polly. Thank them for inventing these things. Thank yeah. you, for the, exactly, the scientists and researchers for inventing this technology. And uh, if you have any questions for our team at the Davis Finney Foundation, you can always send those questions to us at blog at dpf.org. And until our next conversation, we wish, wish you all the best and thank you all for being a part of this conversation. Mm -hmm.